Hello and welcome to today's devotional time. We have been and continue to be in Paul's letter to the Galatian church. And it is profound in nature, but also somewhat um, unfamiliar, if you will, because the issue that he addresses is not in the same context that we live in today, meaning that while we live according to God's promise and not according to the law, most of us are not Jews who have been brought up and raised in the law, so it has not been a part of our identity. But it was for the people that Paul was writing this letter to. So uh, it takes a while to unpack this in its fullest impact with regards to our lives as disciples. And uh, let's get into it today. Let's pray we'll, and uh, go into chapter 3, starting with verse 10 uh, of Paul's letter to the Galatian church. Father, thank you for your word and your spirit that opens our minds and hearts to hear the truth of your word and to recognize it. It is knowing you and your word that gives us the truth that sets us free and uh, free from fear, free from the bondage of fear, I should say, free from regret, free from shame, free from the forces of evil in this world. So as we go into this world, into this, into your word, Lord, please open our hearts once again in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Verse 10, Paul writes this last time we had a devotion. We covered verses 10 through 13. We're going to do a little bit of review, but go on a little further. Paul writes verse 10 for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse because it is written Everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Now, let's just take a, a pause there. What Paul quotes here is an Old Testament uh, scripture verse. And actually, it comes from Deuteronomy 27, 26. Everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. What that entails is you can't pick and choose what parts of the law you're going to observe. You can't pick and choose what part of the Ten Commandments. You can't choose just seven of the ten. And even though some of the laws that Moses gave Israel back um, when they were at Mount Sinai seem almost primitive to us. For example, you, you can't uh, wear clothing with two different types of, of material. Um, you can't eat seafood. Um, things of that nature seem to be just maybe outdated and primitive and, and irrelevant to our times that we live in now. Um, not, not for them, not when the law was given to them. And the purposes behind the law were, were multidimensional. Um, but you can't pick and choose. It's all of it. And so what Paul is saying here is, you can't go back, in his context, to re making Greek people in particular be circumcised just because the law says so. Because if you do, then you've got to adhere and observe all of it. You can't go back to the pick and choose. And this is what he's talking about. It, it is somewhat relevant even today. For example, I'll give you one example that Christians talk about, or some in some circles they talk about, but it is something that is at issue. The Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath day. And there are very few Christians that, that observe the Sabbath day. Very few. We've adhered to or are bought into the idea that the first day of the week, which is Sunday, is the Lord's day, because that's when he was resurrected. And that if you go to church and gather, then that suffices for observing the Sabbath. But no Christian that I know actually observes the Sabbath the way it was given to Moses, which is to not do any work. So that's kind of a pick or choose 
to a degree. And they're, they're, that, 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 that is true for any of the other laws that were given to Moses. So Paul is saying you can't just pick and choose. He goes on in verse 11. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. And now he quotes uh, another Old Testament scripture, uh, the prophet Habakkuk 2.4. And he's talking, he's using two words, justification and righteousness. Righteousness is a word, a theological word that's, you know, pretty loaded because it, it goes through, you know, what does that mean? Ultimately, you don't have to get all theologically trained to understand what's right. In other words, in the, just in common street language, we use that term. Hey, what are you going to do to make it right? Or if somebody does something, it's like, hey, that ain't right. We use this intuitively. Righteousness is the same way. It, it, what makes us right in God's eyes is to trust, to have faith. So Paul is saying that the law doesn't make you right, but it is beneficial because the law is wisdom. And while it may not be able to instill in us trust, it still gives us direction as to what is right. And the purpose of the law is wisdom. And this is what Paul is getting at. He goes on in verse 12, but the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. This is what we were just talking about. You can observe the law and still not trust God. And this is a very, it, it, it can be abstract, it can be theological, but ultimately, if you're practicing discipleship and you're practicing following Jesus, it's a reality that we all face, which is no matter how, how, how disciplined we are in our spiritual life, no matter how dis disciplined we are, in, in practicing discipleship. In other words, we can be disciplined in a life of prayer, disciplined in a life of community, disciplined in a life of, uh, of, of Bible, getting into the word and, and, and Bible study. We can be disciplined in the word of, in, in the ways of worship. We can have a discipline in all these areas of our life. Meditation, <clears throat> meditating on the word, um, solitude, we can have a disciplined spiritual life in all these areas, but that does not in any way replace the necessity and the essential grounding foundation spiritual rock of literally trusting in God. Because that ultimately is the source or, or the means, if you will, of righteousness is to trust in God. It doesn't mean that discipleship is irrelevant, it's essential, but it's essential as it's built on the foundation of trusting in God. So as Christians, if we've, if we've practiced discipleship and we've, we are, are continuing to grow in our understanding, grow in our knowledge, grow in our experience of community living and so on and so forth, and we run into a circumstance in which it really brings up a lot of fear or a lot of anxiety or a lot of doubt, or a lot of disturbance, it's these circumstances that exercises our trust. Because trust is more than, than just a feeling, if you will, of confidence. It's also a practice. And whether we feel confident or not, the practice brings us through. It's very similar to, the, to a military training, if you will, and actually spiritual training disciplines do have a spiritual uh, component that is very much like military training. It is, it is training for conflict. It is training for warfare. However, discipleship helps us train for spiritual battle. And if you've ever trained for any kind of battle, even if it's say in the, in the, in the area of say 
uh, a first responder where you're having to deal with a, a fire or a disaster, but if it's the military as well, whenever the scenario that you're dealing with is so overwhelming in terms of its intensity and its life-threatening uh, situation, your training kicks in to override your instinct to be overwhelmed with fear. And God gives us the gift of discipleship in order to do just that. I've heard it say, and I really, the more and more I, 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 I sit with this, the more and more I, I think it's true. The church, <coughs> excuse me, meaning those who are called out by God, we are meant for discipleship. That's exactly what this community is about. And quite frankly, it's the foundation of what we're about. We can do a lot of other things as well that can be very beneficial and very, very enjoyable, but ultimately it's discipleship. And if we're not growing together, if we're not praying together, if we're not supporting one another, if we're not encouraging one another, if we're not encouraging each other in the word and, and living our lives as disciples for and with each other, then we will not grow in faith, if you will, or we will not grow in discipleship. But if we do that, we will grow in discipleship. And when we either individually or collectively face these situations that can be overwhelming in terms of the threat that they, that they pose, without discipleship, we'll crumble. But with discipleship, that training will kick in regardless if it, regardless if we feel confident or not. And even though in the book of Hebrews it says faith is the assurance of things hoped for, which it is, it's also a training. And so military personnel can go into a battle and feel fear, but their training overrides their fear. They still act out their training. And it's the same with us as disciples. It all goes back to faith. And so Paul says, with regards to verse 11, it is clear that no one is justified or made right by God, by the law, because, and he quotes it, the righteous will live by faith, verse 12. But the law is not based on faith. You can do, you can observe all the law. Every observance there is and still not trust in God, he says. Instead, quote, the one who does these things will live by them, not trust by them, but live by them. He goes on. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on the tree. Now, what is the curse? The curse is not being able to live by trust. There is a curse for that. The curse will come if we are unable to live by trust and instead live by Anything else other than trust. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's our own abilities, whatever the case may be. This is what we see play out in Genesis 3. Eve did not live by trust. And as such, her actions brought into this world and into her relationship with Adam and into her very being the curse of sin. The curse of rebellion, the curse that brought into this world death and decay, the curse that brought into this world the, the, the frustration that we feel of not being able to accomplish things that, that we need to accomplish, that we want to accomplish, the curse of being, of, of being subject to um, our human nature that's built on jealousy and... Um, Self-focus, selfishness. So already in, in, in uh, chapter 3 of Genesis, we see that when Eve did not live by faith, she ushered in a curse. This is what Paul is talking about in verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung in a tree. And now he's, he's giving insight as to what God revealed to him with regards to the work of Christ. And this is what we're going to pick up next time uh, when we come together is this, this divine um, act of God that took the curse upon himself that was brought in by 
mistrust and instead gave us. It's, a, it's the divine um, uh, giving and, 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 and taking upon himself our condition. And that's what we'll pick up next time. And until then, may we continue to learn how to live by faith. And as such, learn how to live in God's grace and the power of his grace because we have been redeemed. I look forward to uh, getting back into this letter next time. And until then, may the peace of God be with you. I'll see you then.